which does not need, but it's one that Paul has been doing with Steve Marin at, at uh, you and Ezra Miller and a couple other folks. So that's going to be examples of the kinds of stuff I'm talking about. All right. Oh, that's interesting. So uh, a, here's the basic methodology. Nothing new here to, to any of you, I expect. Uh, I just wanted to lay out the strategy, which is to, uh, uh, we're, when we're looking at a problem, we're starting with some kind of data and some kind of question we're asking about the data, perhaps some kind of query or something. Typically, some kind of pre processing to clean the data, maybe yes, maybe no. Um, and some kind of transformation, and that's a very important part of the process. How do you take whatever data you might have and turn it into something that we can, uh, TDA types can apply our methodology to? So that's top row, and that transformer bullet is, is much larger because I think there's a lot of interesting ideas and work and much work to do in that, that compartment. Then from the TDA ready, ready data to computing persistence diagram, the methods there, obviously, a lot more to can be are, are coming along, and algorithms that are running faster. I think the, the work of Don Sheehy, for example, recently is a, is really incredible to speed things up, et cetera. So, but but nevertheless, I think we all sort of know that there are a lot of different methods to to go from data to to uh, uh, and we call diagrams. Going to call some uh, barcodes. In any case, that's the same thing. And I want to take those, and we want to somehow recognize in those diagrams. What the what the critical features are for the data, so that we, we can do like classification or uh, regression. So um, there's a, another big bullet there, which I think is quite interesting, and the two of these are really the focus of uh, of what we're trying to talk about and then illustrate. Which is, you take the persistence diagrams and then extract features, by which I mean vectors in some feature space. So then plug in and use existing methods from statistics and machine learning. So it is not to reinvent any wheel. And so what it means is raw data to clean data. There's a lot of stuff there. TDA methods, there's a lot of stuff there. And feeds to classification and regression, there's a lot of stuff there. So we want to take advantage of all that. And TDA, it's it's rightful as a, as a maybe you like to think of it as a statistic uh, or into statistics and machine learning and other things like that as the best way to prove it. And the examples I'm going to illustrate, I'm really going to try to focus on that because because what, what we show is that if you try to do TDA by itself, it doesn't necessarily be better than anything else. The whole point is combining it with existing methods can be a very helpful approach. Okay. So what about what I mean by those two critical things, transformers and extractors. Sorry for the choice of words. Uh, couldn't guess what else to call them. So example of what I mean by transforming data is maybe the data is in such a big space. I mean, everybody talks about big data. We TD people really can't deal with that big of data. So one of the things you can do is to reduce the dimension, not all the way down, but down to a reasonable size so that we can uh, we can use methods. Another that uh, various people will use sliding windows. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, really, we started augmenting the sliding window idea with what we're calling community accepted features, and I'll show you that. And then uh, the the one of the examples rests on the concept of uh, Persistent local homology, which builds up something, uh, a local spherical distance method that, that, that Paul and uh, one of his graduates worked out. So these are examples of what I mean by transformers. And let me just show you a little bit. So here's, oh, I'm sorry, that's the wrong, that's the, uh, that's the Veterian Church of America. Ah, yeah, that's the right one, sorry. Wrong PCA example there. Um, so I mentioned reduction means you take your, your, your um, um, PCA is what comes up if you do a Google search. Uh, you take your, your, your data and you do some kind of method for dimension reduction. We spend a lot of time trying to understand these. Isomap, linear embedding, Hessian LLE, eigenmaps, diffusion geometry, local PCA, et cetera. These are all methods of taking the data and trying to actually get it to a, a reasonable set. I'm not going to say any more about these methods. I just wanted to put that down as, in some sense, one way to transform the data where we can work with it more directly. Another uh, that we've been we've been enjoying working with recently is uh, the sliding windows or delay reconstruction, as it's known to people in dynamical systems method. I read today because he proved really fundamental theorem that makes this useful. This is used by some other people, and and Mikhail had uh, used this in the uh, circular coordinates. Uh, uh, actually, in a paper after circular coordinates, I think they used this delay reconstruction 
with dimensional persistence and stuff. Sorry about that. And uh, but in any case, uh, Jose proved what I think is the fundamental theorem here, which is that uh, which is exactly how to how to decide the so-called window size for this. So the method is, as you see on the left hand side there, you see a time series, and you choose a window, and choose window size, which approximating the quasi period that you're looking for, right? So you might think, well, I can do this on any size window, but if you choose this one, you get most robust score, one dimensional persistence score out of it. So you take that window and you look at, uh, in this case, you just look at the function values of a time series in the window, take those as coordinates of a point. So if there's 20, 20 types in that, you get a point 20 dimensional space. Slide the window down. You don't jump it down to the next level. You slide it one step at a time. And when you have a signal which is uh, periodic or even quasi periodic, which I find is that the point cloud that you get in the higher dimensional space tends to have circular shape. And so, then compute, uh, use functional persistence to try to measure what that is. And then, Jose, an idea of how to create a score from that, which we used in a number of applications, then called swipe or sliding when the one-dimensional persistence score. The matter is knowing what size window to take, and that was actually a very pretty theorem there. So that's an, I think that's another type of example of transformer, which is, which is good to keep in mind. I mean, there's similar ones that I'm sure you all know, like, for example, taking images and looking at masks, looking at values in a mask, uh, like that, or you can look at time series of functions and apply the mask to that as if it was an image. There's a lot of different ways to do these, these kinds of transformations. We uh, we doing uh, was what you know what do we do when the data gets so big or or or, or messy and noisy? How do you go, how do you go about actually doing this? When does it work to just apply it as I described it? So Chris is a graduate student here um, came up with an alternative which which we like a lot, which is to to say instead of taking in the window, instead of taking the actual function values. Which you take a window and you have to pick the size that you know is going to give the best answers for, for when the cycle repeats. And within that window, compute features it directly there, right? So you don't have to just take the raw function values. This means what this means, of course, is you can take features that are well known to whatever community is used to working with that data, which is why we call it community accepted features. For example, he studies music and he, he computes these these sets of features that you see here, these are examples, um, which are, you know, these are things that people study music always use. So what you end up with is a, is a different representation of the signal. And you have two advantages. One is typically you end up with a smaller dimensional signal. And uh, secondly, you don't throw away what everybody else knows about what's how to make uh, important uh, characteristics of whatever data you're studying. Um, so. So I think it's a really a really critical idea. Oh, there's a third part, which is when you figure something out, you can explain it to people because of too often we we come up with things and then we can't explain them to the uh, to the users or the people in the community. So here's an example of uh, of what Chris did in the in this uh, in one case. This is I don't remember what piece of music this is. He studied quite a lot, but this example where um, he was considering a. a, a you know, we're looking for repetitive patterns in the music. He's looking for when you find the bridge, the chorus, et cetera. And can, can he actually find this through the one dimensional persistence? So the size window predicted that one should be uh, on the order of 153,600 uh, dimensions. And uh, you can sort of see what the signal looks like in the upper left hand corner. But instead, what he did is he chose, uh, in this case, a few more than on the previous slide, 59 dimensional community accepted features. And uh, which are known to be of interest in music. And so if you take the raw signal and do PCA, you see this got awful mess on the left. But on the right, you actually see a more accurate, uh, interesting representation of what the music is. And he has a, a tool that allows you to sort of watch, watch music move around so that you move it from the coast to the bridge and back. So this, this is a transformation that I, I think is a particularly powerful one, good example of that, uh, that process. Hey, John, are, John, are these are these community accepted features functorial? Functorial. I mean, I mean so that if, if you change the window size, would you get a a mapping a linear between the community accepted? Some features? yes, some no. I, I guess I don't know um, these particular 59 features well enough to answer that. You know, based on uh, 
uh, looking for modes, that kind of things. Others, I mean, something like timbre. I don't know. That's a good question, people. Okay, uh, then another example is if you've got a large data set, then you might actually want to, uh, you might zoom in at different regions. And some years ago, Dimitri and Paul and Herbert and I uh, reaper on uh, can persistent local homology. Uh, and it was a, you know, it was a nice theory, but the algorithm that came out was really quite difficult to use. I mean, it was a tour de force by Herbert to work out the algorithm, but it ended up very hard to implement. So more recently, Paul and an undergraduate, Brian Jacobs, in here came up with a very nice way of computing what you might call local spherical distance. And here is if I've got a point, uh, it's the point in this picture, and I look at a ball, the ball of radius r, I want to sort of, I want to make sense of what it means to talk about, let's say, the relative homology of the points inside the ball relative to the outside, which of course is a little silly since the outside might not even intersect the point cloud at all, but it's meaning, you know, what is the object? What, what's the relative homology for the object this appears to be a sample from? And so one of the one of the things that goes into that, of course, you've got the the actual persistent homology for the points inside the ball, but you've also got the homology of the, the one-dimensional homology of the boundary. And for that, they computed this local spherical distance, which is a very clever algorithm. If you start with two points x and look at the uh, you, you balls around them, what you can do you can find the first place where the ball about x and the, the radius where the ball about x and the ball about y meet each other and meet the sphere of radius r and find that to be the distance between y and x. So this, this gives a very good approximation for what ought to be a spherical distance as to very quickly now compute. You don't even, by the way, need to have the points, the coordinates of the point. You can do it from a global pairwise distance matrix. So this allows you to compute a, a concept of, uh, of local spherical distance, and then you can apply a persistence to that and characterize shape. So it's another kind of, of example of transform. And I'm sure there's a hundred. These are just meant as illustrations of uh, that part of the process. Okay. Um, we go now to, oh, by the way, that only works if you assume, I mean, if points are too far away, this, this is a good approximation. This is only if they're within that distance. Okay, then go to the second half. This is less developed, and it's kind of ad hoc what we particularly have done, um, with the exception of the last one for which there's a, a more established, I think, theory. The, uh, uh, extractors, by which I mean methods of taking a persistence diagram and getting a bunch of numbers, uh, which are the course of a vector uh, that we've played with, and I'm sure others out there, but by the way, I meant to say at the beginning, I know other people have been thinking about TDA and persistence and machine learning. And I realized that if I were to actually try to chase that, chase down all the work, I would really offend at least 50% of the people who've done work. So let me apologize for that and suggest that, you know, maybe the network should provide a mechanism for people to step forward and have done stuff like that too. Anyway, okay, going back to this. So one of the methods is binning. You just sort of count how many points are in uh, which part of the space. Uh, sorting, sorting, sorting and grabbing, uh, you can do some mix models, or there's Gunner's uh, syzygy coordinates. Gunner is somebody whose name I forgot, so I apologize for that. Okay, let me show you binning. We actually use this in an example, which I'll come back to in a minute. Uh, binning is just the, the simple idea of of, of recognizing that if I look at a persistence diagram, it counts as how many points are located in the parts of the of the persistence diagram uh, framework itself, right? And the reason that this has sort of this as being a good thing to do is that we're finding more and more that it's not the points a long way from the diagonal necessarily the predictors of what it is you're trying to use to to understand or classify your data set. Very often, the shapes of the data cloud near the diagonal are also very critical uh, components, or in fact, sometimes more important, right? So to do that, this is a very naive method, and it's very unstable, and about it is, so you shouldn't do it, but it actually worked, at least in some cases. Uh, when, uh, what you do is first you, well, it's, it's actually you want to draw these bits that are drawn in the bottom right, you want to divide the uh, the space for the diagram up in the square. So we just tra transform the diagram into birth and persistence, the x coordinates birth and the y persistence. Just cut that space into bins and simply count how many points are in each bin. Right? 
And he then gives you a coordinate, and that transforms the diagram into a vector and, and whatever space the number of bins is. Okay, so that's the big idea, very straightforward. Another one, which uh, Paul actually, in, in one of the applications we're going to mention, uh, figured out bending didn't work very well. So an alternative is to say, okay, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to worry quite so much about uh, what it is, but uh, you know, what it is in terms of bat burn death and that sort of thing. But maybe what I'll do is I'll look at the, let's say, the hundred or whatever top distance points. So, um, and by the way, that, that that's that of course introduces an interesting question on the bending. The number of bends is constant, so the dimension of the of the feature space is fixed. In this, you have to pick the top hundred, even if there's only five. If you get vector in uh, in dimensional space, so you do have to uh, you do have to deal with that kind of a question. But take these and grab the coordinates or the persistence or whatever you want for those particular uh, values. Whoops, that's being grabbing. Um, and then to do, which uh, we've been playing quite with with colleagues in stats, Dave Dunson especially, um, and uh, Nate Strawn as well. Uh, is look at the idea that I mean, if you look at the name, one of the objections you might have to, to it is that, as I said, it's unstable. So if I if I get how many points are in a box and I move the diagram a little bit, that can obviously jump up because those can pop up in another box. Uh, it's also it's also and it doesn't really do any kind of conditioning. So there'd be some conditioning, uh, uh, probable conditioning on the number of points in adjacent bins. You know, maybe it's more or less likely depending on the problem you're doing, that you'll find a bin in a certain, you know, so you find a point in a certain bin based on whether they're points in adjacent bins. So these, yeah, I, I'm sure there's a dozen other problems with binning. It's just a course model that sometimes works. So uh, an alternative is maybe what you can do is you can choose, you can think of the bins as being, uh, being sort of positions where you have a constant value one on your bin and zero outside. So more generally, you could actually think about choosing a uh, number of Gaussians with, located at certain certain knots, and then for each one of those, you could then look maybe persistence diagram against that Gaussian and treat that as the ith coordinate. Consider all, all of those. Um, there are actually more sophisticated ways to to do what we just said. This is just a, meant to relate it to what we did before. But, but the that is that actually does provide something that's a little more stable to moving points around. So, but I have to admit, of all the examples. We've tried the bidding has worked pretty well as close as this Gaussian method. The sort of grabbing does seem to be a very different different sort of thing. The last one, and and I know there have been there's been at least one paper, and I apologize I forget the name of the person who did this using uh, the the C coordinates that uh, Gunner came up with, which uh, these are very nice coordinates in one way. They're they're designed so these you take a D as a persistence diagram, and uh, you look at uh, Look at birth and death times. Look at all the all the points in the diagram, and you look at the birth and death times, and you take the persistence, and you goes up. Let's say, right? Uh, and then, if you want, then you can weight that by some multiple of the birth times and the death times. And so you get different kinds of coordinates in this way. Uh, the positive about doing this is they see the thing about this is as opposed to the diagonal, you see that the uh, that the difference, the di minus bi, goes to zero. So those points dry out. So these coordinates are very nicely uh, fit um, between the, the uh, as you move between one diagram and another. Um, also, they have some continuity properties and that sort of thing. Uh, if somebody has a question here. Is there a question? A question, but okay. Um, but side of it is it it suffers from one. This this one still suffers from the one problem which we have been trying to avoid, which is it really it, it focuses on that you know getting, uh, maybe that's not totally fair, but I do I do feel like it kind of over it kind of overemphasizes higher persistence. Maybe that's totally fair. I guess if the if you have a lot of points of low persistence, but if you have a hybrid situation with some high persistence, some low persistence, then you're really tracking where those points are quite as much. Say this is another approach, and leave it at that. All right. So, having, uh, having gone through that now, I want to now talk about uh, three examples. 
where where we've used these ideas and what we've been able to sort of come up with. Uh, not any super fancy, but I'm just trying to make the point to to everyone that I think there's a wide open uh, a wide open set of things that one can do, and and this method is uh, this pipeline is actually uh, uh, it's incredibly flexible for for use our methods. So okay, um, here one. Uh, the fundamental example here comes from a, a set or a collection of data sets that's that we got access to through colleagues at it's called ACS Applied Communication Systems. And the data sets that they were working with are um, ten uh terrors of live data collected by an airplane flying over a region somewhere in California. And the data sets are labeled as being a terrain data set or a patient data set. So the idea is that the points in one are actually tracking the, the three dimensional, the voxel locations of the, the, of the of all the vegetation, the leaves and the bushes and that sort of thing. And the points in the other, which is drawn in black, in this, are points that are reflecting terrain. And of course, there's still a lot of uh, three dimensional aspect in that as well. But, you know, to I, I think, think it's pretty clear when you look at data sets, which is which. And so, this is, uh, I don't think this is actually one of the ones that's on the, uh, the UC uh, base, uh, machine learning database set, but it's the kind of thing that you expect to find from there. They have a lot of bases of these. If you've seen the, that data, that, um, that, by the way, I highly recommend it. There's all kinds of interesting data sets there. So, um, so the idea is now you take these 20 sets and you grab a point out of one with a neighborhood without knowing what it is, and you try to see if you can figure out what kind of uh, which two types you have? That's, that's the big question. Okay, so um, um, and there's two other examples of synthetic data sets on the left there that we're testing this. So the uh, the idea. Oh yeah, I guess I should have put this slide up before. Uh, this, these are the folks that wrote the paper on the right there. And so the idea is that they used is what's called multi-scale local PCA. So what this is is you. You take a point in your data set and you look at, uh, well, they're drawn squares here, so I guess they, they use boxes of different diameters, okay, around the point. And the box, you look at all points inside and you do PCA just on those points. So you see in this slide, when you're in, at scale one, which is the largest scale, you look at all of those points. The best fit ellipse is vertical, as you see. As you move in smaller, all those points below disappear, the data set seems to tilt. So you'll see the best fit ellipse tilt to the right, and then you move in even smaller, uh, it tilts even more. And more importantly, also, you'll notice that the size of the of eigen, eigenvalues tends to be uh, pretty the same by the time you move in at small, at small scale. So this is like, so you can, in general, you have some manifold in higher dimensional space. For example, near that, if you you zoom in really close, you expect to find that the that the uh, that PCA tells you the thing is maximal dimension. But as you zoom out, you're going to see uh, you get at some smaller dimension, the dimension of the manifold. And then if the manifold's curved, you'll start to see other phenomena, et cetera. They use this method, and uh, what, at each point they they computed uh, point in each radius. They computed the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. It's a three dimensional data set of so three eigenvalues and uh, nine eigenvalue coordinates, so 12 coordinates at each radius. Then they, they computed this for a lot of different points and ended up throwing away all but just a few, so but nevertheless maybe four or five points, and uh, uh, use those as the, as the features that they associated to each point in the data set and went through the support vector machine method to do that. Actually, when they did this, they were actually able to outperform uh, all of the other methods at the time that were out there. So we wondered if we could uh, add something to that. And uh, what we decided to do was to not try to repeat, but rather add to that the concept of persistent local homology. Okay. And what we what we did is at each of those individual scales, we 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 computed persistent local homology, and we just and the main experiment we did, we just took the highest persistent feature 
as, the, as an extra coordinate. Okay, that's the, the DTLH. Although obviously you could do much more than that. You could do multiple. You could do all of the features. You could do any other thing you wanted to extract out of the PLH methodology. Okay. So an example of what the kind of thing you'll see. So here, what well, we we did we did some synthetic examples first. A Y and X and a sort of a a, a triple triple crossing at the origin. We took these just uh, just as a warm up example, and we we sampled these many many different times. And for those data sets, then we we computed uh, ML PCA plus uh, PLH at its radii. We compared the uh, the the classification capabilities of each methods. And so what we found was by if you use MLPA, you had about a 13% error. So you can kind of understand this, right? If you look at the set point there and you take all of the points within the neighborhood and try to do PCA on that, it's going to think that it's two-dimensional because it doesn't have a clear one-dimensional uh, dimensional uh, there. I mean, you could say, well, what I should do is I should look at nearby points, see that they're one-dimensional and study how that changes as we come into the point, sure, but that's that in higher dimensions, that's pretty tough. So we we'll actually say instead of that, we want to add the PCA, the PCA and the, I mean, sorry, the, uh, the PLA, persistent homology. And in some sense, this is a nice idea because it, it, it it's much slower to compute PLA. So what we can do is run uh, scale local PCA first, and then at places where you're not sure what's going on, then you bring in the, the head. And so what we're trying to prove is that that that, that method uh, actually puts some value. So in this particular case, it turns out that around those points, the PLH outperforms uh, MLPA. But even with even with that, when you put the two of them together, we got the best performance of all. So there's an example of of uh, a feature adding it to something other people have done, and getting better performance. Uh, example: We took uh, we took a, a headline. Uh, look in the XY plane, look at uh, just the, the, the region where Y goes from 0 to 1. On the right-hand side, X from minus 1 to 1. On the left, X 0 to 1. Sample 200 points on the line and 200 points off of the line. Compute features to try to classify these two different data sets. And in case, if you think about what happens if you start a point on the heavy line and you take a neighborhood, clearly the left-hand side, what you have is should be, should have, the homology of an interval, so it should be should be, uh, thing in the one-dimensional persistence. On the right-hand side, however, you should have a circle, so you expect that PLH would be good for that, and that's pretty well, 7.83 percent. Where uh, uh, CA by itself, if you do that, remember one of the first things PCA does is it means centers the data set, et cetera. So it's actually to avoid uh, avoid you know just pointing towards the mean from whatever point you take. So it uh, it it just just sees these things as being fairly equivalent, I guess I should say, and so so the performance is actually pretty poor for MLPCA in that case. But when we put them together, we got, got better performance. Okay. Tell ourselves when we did this example, the one that they uh, that they wrote the paper about. Um, well, we took a hundred, I think a thousand. Sorry, there should have been a thousand points from each of the ten sets, um, and did this kind of a classification. And PLH by itself wasn't very good in this particular case. And I guess that's probably because the ground terrain is pretty noisy as well and doesn't have, doesn't have uh, uh, anywhere near the kind of clear topological features that would distinguish it. As I recall, actually, there were a lot of gaps in the data set, too, because it's taken from an airplane and a lot of things are missing. But in any case, it's, the, it's still the case that when we combine the two, we get somewhat better performance. So this is a a complete, complete honest uh, appraisal of, of when this stuff helps and when it doesn't. But I think combining the methods is what, what I was trying to make the point for. I'll give it, let me do the next example that we've been working on. We work on this one for years off and on. And then what we're doing is we're trying to track vehicles driving around. So what we have here is um, just a simulated scenario, and I'll show you what we simulated from a couple of slides. Uh, two different vehicles driving along on the roadways. Well, we've drawn the path of the drivers, not the roadways or anything. There's some kind of um, EO sensor that's on a fixed platform that's observing these, uh, and electro-optical sensor from, uh, from the air. 
there. Uh, the idea is that the, uh, the two drivers are driving and then they come into a kind of location and then they take off. And what happens is if you if you run through, through the trackers that a lot of people that are often used, um, you'll get you'll often get these two who confuse. What happens is as the as the vehicles come close together, they may slow down or stop. The uh, the motion detector. Which is a, which underlies identifying where where the vehicles are. Got you know longer is, is doing any is very because they're not moving much, and it gets them confused. And so we'd like to be able to recover the path that you see here instead of getting uh, getting set backwards. So the idea is to use the behavior of the, uh, of the individual driver before it gets confused, and to try to then recover afterwards which one was which based on that. Okay. So we thought, well, this is this is going to this is going to require anything too sophisticated. We just zero-dimensional persistence on a speed profile. Uh, actually, an oversimplification. We must have tried a uh, hundred of other different things and all kinds of fancy methods and stuff. But interestingly, the simplest method actually worked quite well in this particular case. So we had a speed profile for a normal pro, a driver, and what about that? You look at that. That function is just the speed of the driver over some interval of time. And you look at zero-dimensional persistence filtering by height. And see, there's one well off the diagonal corresponding to the local max and the, the, the min. You know, we're sort of ad hocing the fact that we have a, a an interval and not an actual completion there. Um, and then there's one point near the diagonal for a small little wiggle that you see over on the right. right. More erratic driver is going to have, have more points. And interestingly, uh, the kinds of driving patterns that you find for people who are more aggressive switching lanes, other kinds of driving, often show show up with a bunch of points near the diagonal. And so this is an example of what I mentioned before that we don't want to just look for high resistance points in the diagram. So in here's this here's the stereo. And what we did, and this is what happens uh, about the topological features. Then when we did the topological features, we actually got an improved performance. So this is here. In this particular example, you see that the tracker got them confused. So this is a multi-hypothesis tracker that's used at APL. It's been around a long time, very well developed. It's actually used in the real world. And what happens is uh, after, after, they, uh, after they head off, it has no way of recovering who's who. But uh, what happens in this one is you have the same confusion up to a certain point where until just enough time has evolved so that the erratic, so that the feeding behavior, if you will, of the light blue driver can reemerge, and this is in the movie. But if you'd seen the movie, what happens is confusing until we get to where those red dots are, and all of a sudden the tracker switches. So it well to uh, to improve that performance. So uh, here's the thing that we here's the way we went about actually discovering this uh, this method that we could use. There's a um, uh, a sailor driving patterns called sumo simulate simulation of urban mobility was uh, created I think by the Used by oh I forget it's a it's the German Department of Transportation I forget something like that anyway they have this very nice simulator and you can take this and you can you can take uh, a an aerial map uh, you have to have various kinds of information about it you can start the cars which are the little blue arrows and if you look carefully in the middle you'll see a couple of green arrows you can start them and you assign them different driving characteristics some gears some drive more quickly go around curve fast that sort of thing. So we we worked with this, and we took the simulator and we applied the real tracker to it and got our tracklets and we kind of trained them on a, on the different kinds of behavior. And what we found was if we did the same process I mentioned earlier about binning, where we took the diagrams, transformed them, uh, gridded them, and then sort of looked at the kinds of the expected, if you will, persistence diagram patterns that you would find. Then you know, on average, the non-aggressive one looks somewhat like the one on the left and the more aggressive one on the right. Uh, you know, th these are real extreme examples. In general, they're not as, they're not obviously different as that. But nonetheless, it was something that we were able to train, figure out how to weight which diagram uh, we take. And we, did, we went through uh, that. We had uh, the slide that Nate, Nate prepared on, on that he had 100,000 training samples, 10,000 validation, 10,000 test samples, and I used a likelihood test to do the to the classification. And that result was, as I said, uh, without and then with, with we have the performance pretty significant.
So that's a really nice example. We didn't use any fancy topology. We're trying to apply this to much more complicated scenarios where we do have to use more sophisticated methods. Just the 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 hard part, so that so I can make that point. The hard part is taking whatever we get out and translating into something that can be used inside the tracker. So we had to figure out how to how to trans how to how to take the persistent diagrams, turn them into features create hoods out of those so they could be plugged into uh, the multi houses tracker. I might go into how all that works, but I don't, that doesn't, that's not the point of today's talk. So go on to uh, the final example. So here's one last example. This is not my work at all. This is Paul's work with Steve Marin and some other folks. I think they're all at UNC, at least some of them are. Um, and, uh, this is uh, each of the vessels uh, in a human brain. Um, by different different length, they're actually different components of the graph, which is kind of down at the bottom. Um, and this is this is based on uh, imaging done with MRI, which is then uh, followed by sort of tube tracking algorithms, so that these are the fairly accurate then images of of the actual locations of the blood vessels for individuals. And then the question is, uh, let's see, the question is, can you somehow look at that? And something about the patient, and it turns out that people who do this stuff, they say, well, I've noticed that older people, I see different sort of patterns for the vasculature. They tends to, the vessels tend to maybe spiral a bit, or people have certain kinds of diseases, I'll see different kinds of patterns. So the question that, that uh, Paul and everybody set out to do was to try to understand if they could correlate sheep for these objects to age. Uh, perhaps a disease, and uh, then I know recently, although I'm not going to mention that, the results on that uh, on gender as well. Uh, and, uh, so here's the process. Um, you take your take your vessels and you them. You can just start at the bottom and sweep up with a pain. Uh, that's fed by height. And jump. look at what happens to components. So you're not complement of the region. You're simply looking at the region itself. And so the twists and turns have to do with going up and down in, in the direction you take. Um, and an alternative, which is actually similar to what we did some ago when we were studying plant root systems, is start with the uh, start with the vessels and sort of think of growing them and looking at the one-dimensional persistence for what you get when you form that union. Okay. Uh, I'm not of roots, we were actually looking at the persistence of the complement as we grew the region. But in case, uh, if you want to look at 1D persistence, you can grow them, and you clearly you see things, if you've got things that loop around and come back, you'll create cycles, which eventually will. will okay. Of course, the way we really do that is you sample the thing many times, and then you just you do a RIPS complex or something, and then you compute one-dimensional persistence. Then is uh, they they so here's an example by the way on the right of 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 a cycle in the second approach, which I'm sort of medium size. They had a, they found a bunch a bunch of small ones and a bunch of bigger ones. Okay, they take these and they're going to extract features. So uh, according to Paul, they tried the binning approach. I'm not sure what others, and it didn't work very well. So instead, what they decided to do was to take the top 100 persistences uh, for the points. One take the the place whose persistence was was top 100 values and rank those by size. Try to use those as the uh, you can just take the persistence values, get a point in 100 100 in space, and use those as the uh, training features to uh, um, to study this. So uh, what they did, uh, as I said, they take brains. They uh, they then took these features. Um, they ran PCA on those features. Okay. So we're doing, I mean, so we're doing persistence on persistence here, right? You're calculating using persistence to create the features. Now we want to find some sort of shape description, if you will, on the on the uh, the feature vectors. So we ran PCA on those, looked at the first eigen vector, sort of looked at at the line that creates, predicted each onto that, get a coordinate that they called PC1, and then correlate that with H, and that is the graph. That you down below, um, age on the bottom, PC1 score on the left, if you can see, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, 
it's, what are the different colors? Maybe the different co I've forgotten now what the different colors are. Maybe those are are those actually age groups? It looks like it. In any case, though, you see that you see a, a, a fairly good correlation as you move to the right. You'll find that, um, that this particular feature score uh, that actually represents pretty well uh, the age of the brain. So each brain gets a PC1 score by where it projects. And then you've got the age, and uh, uh, be a pretty good predictor. So they do. Yeah, I actually thought about what happens if, for example, so what are we doing here? We're taking the top 100 persistence values. You might say, well, you know, maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll do something different. Maybe what I'll do, I'll take on the top 100, uh, the top 200, let's say, I guess they did. I'll say, I'm going to I'm going to take all the persistence scores between. Maybe I'll take the 30th longest one up to the 70th, okay? And what you see here is the correlation score uh, for uh, 0.3070, and you go up and you see the color, uh, and that's supposed to be the correlation score for the features which were in that particular range. Uh, does that, I mean, so what I'm saying is the reason you have black on the upper right triangle is, is a look at the bar, which is... You know, the, the 40th to the 70th um, uh, persistence score. So you're not going to see anything on the right because that then you would you'd empty interval. And uh, and see this complete chart. And it's kind of interesting because what you notice is that if you look in the upper left corner, you get bad scores. You get red scores. In the upper left corner, that, that's that really, um, that's see, oops, let's see, let me think. That, oh yeah, that's right. That's keeping your persistence window. Saying, hmm, I wonder if I've got this backwards. I wonder if the numbers, if you're there, Paul, speak up. I wonder if the numbers are scored from the top. But I think the upper left one is essentially corresponds to picking the most persistent feature, and the hope that that actually it turns out not to be a good indicator. In fact, if you if you look at wider intervals. In particular, looking at smaller features down near the far right, that, uh, um, that what you'll find is that uh, you get the scores. So you can't, you probably can't read this plot. The picture is a little bit blurred. Let me just go over it one more time to make sure you understand. The bottom, the bottom scale is uh, is the left hand start of the realm of persistences. Yes, and we're starting from highest to lowest. So if we get forty. That means I'm going to take the 40th. If the if the number is 40, I'm going to take the 40 largest persistence number. And if I go up to 80, the point comma 80 that says we take the the scores which are which are from the 40th largest to the 80th largest. And the the color tells me how good I do. And the, the, the whiter, yellower colors are the higher scores. So it looks, in fact, that the 40th longest bar roughly is the best predictor, interestingly, was the the big one is not a good predictor at all. So, so let, let me end there the, uh, of all of this was, number one, to make case that uh, there's a very nice pine where there's lots and lots of work to do to deal with, uh, to deal with different kinds of data challenges. But the hardest part, uh, I think, this pipeline is at the beginning part to take raw data and figure out how to make it TD ready. This is a place where one has to work with sub subject matter experts. I know, having worked quite some time now with a, a biology colleague, that his expertise, sir, his expertise is just completely valuable. I wouldn't have any idea what I was doing without uh, without uh, uh, with him. And then the interpretation of persistence diagrams on the back end and how to how to meet different kinds of features that are, are pulled out. So there's a lot of a lot of work to do on the front end and the back end, but this is uh, this is a framework that I think is uh, is broad and very useful. And I intend to work on this the rest of my life. I think it's a, a great approach to trying to apply TDA to different kinds of data. And let me stop there. Don. Do we have any questions in the audience? Is 
So, so while we're waiting for other questions, John, maybe you can tell us a bit more about um, the, the, the unit instead of the binning. Is, is Gaussians in two, 2D or Gaussians in per, diagram space? So that's an interesting question. I don't know how to do the, here we go, back here, two uh how to do that in diagram space in a way that, uh, um, in a way that captures something that I might want. I'm not saying that's not the case. That might actually be a great way to do it. Uh, I really had put that down and sort of chatting with Jay earlier, really make the case for knowing how to do that at all. So if we can actually put distributions on persistence diagram space, that would be great. Those who have studied those spaces recently have been kind of pleased at how difficult they are. In fact, I know Peter, your your work on uh, on means uh, means of persistence diagrams was inspired by how nasty that space is and trying to come up with an alternative. Uh, so I think that could be done, but I think that's hard. So what I'm really thinking about here was the idea that we have use uh, in persistence diagram space you end with a bunch of point not in persistence diagram space. I'm sorry, in plane in the in the quadrant you would choose a bunch of points to be means and you choose some variances. And you would use the uh, the scores you get from each of those as coordinate, and then you try to train your system. That gives them the capability of uh, of learning with those points and which of those variances are the best choices as well. So it fit into a a uh, statistical I mean a problem that people in statistics are uh, are accomplished at doing. It's kind of it's called I think a Dirichlet process that that addresses these. So that's what I was thinking of. On persistence space. I was just thinking that would be hard to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, may maybe your way of doing it might allow that. I don't know. The thought. Uh, Cheyenne and Kate and some other people have done some work on in direction and kind of refact the the points that would go over the di diagonal and uh, like that. Sure. Yeah. Only uh, you know even this way of doing it. Right, you've got to deal with those issues. You know, you're going to. What do you mean to put a Gaussian on the square when, 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 when you think about the regions outside of the, outside the uh, like below the diagonal, or that sort of thing. So yeah, our last paper with Shannon and Kate and and Liz uh, and Paul was was all focused on that. Uh, how do you go about dealing with? That? What do you do, Julia? John, if you're problem is want to make sure that you're stable. There's no reason why you have to make it integral over a Gaussian. I mean, you could take any type of thing with a, you know, a positive area of support. You could just sure. look at the measure of the intersection of a ball. I mean, there's no reason why it has to be Gaussian, is there? No, really. It's just a matter of I'm sort of constantly obsessed these days about making sure things can be computed quickly. So but the intersection of two, the area of an intersection of two sets should be quicker than computing the integral of a Gaussian over a set. Correct. Yeah, that's a good point. Good point. Um, In general, any kind of, kind of um, no. Let's, let's leave it there. Yeah. <laughs> John, I have a quick question over your first example. Uh, okay. This one. Where you showed that the last data set you have using TDA method does not have relatively good um, cluster. Um, I was wondering if there's ways in, in those cases to actually to do complete local homology computation to do uh, initial testing and to understand the space and how the distribution of System local homology is distributed to estimate, in sense, um, or the power of TDA method. Yeah. Before you do a four-blowing TDA computation. Right. Two two comments there. First of all, uh, uh, TLH again. This is only taking the top value. Remember, so obviously one can use more features. But second of all, I know what you're talking about. The work that you guys did, um, and certainly I think you're right. I think I think to do an exploration more subtly using multiple scales of LH and then be able to, to uh, 
to adapt to that way is a, is a very good idea. Absolutely. This was meant, you know, okay, we're just going to add this one feature and see how it does. But, but that's it. Yeah, but um, actually, my, my comment, um, there, there are slightly maybe more vague comment in a sense that you showed in your talk that if I combine TDA with some of the machine learning or statistics method, um, the hope is that it will make right. it more powerful in terms of classific classification. It has more, less classification. Error. So the question is whether you can do the initial explore research. For example, in this case, if I just sample the space a little bit, do a little bit of local homology computation, even with the highest persistent, but that will give me an idea of how the local feature is distributed so that I will know whether TDA will be effective well, like as a guesstimate, even before I do a full um, yeah, blowing. Good idea. I mean, in some sense, what we the other way around, that's what we call MOSA, right? Would you do, I mean, we're not computing at, at every point anyway, so we're, we're, we're running multi-scale local PCA in various locations, and when we feel we have a clear answer, we're happy, but we have a vague answer, especially if we have an answer that says that most of the time it's one-dimensional or two-dimensional, but at this point it's 50-dimensional then we think it's worth going and investigating more. So we've been doing it that, that way, but your approach also works for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As to you, I send you these data sets and let you play with them, see what you, what you get. Okay, that would be great. Yeah. Thanks. Just a bit more about the uh, the local vertical distance, which uh, could, could you give intuition as to why we give to you? So instead of intersect, finding when points, like the ball and two points intersect, uh, kind of reducing that, that thing at points uh, on the square radius of some three radius are. Yeah. So the idea uh, is to um, uh, is to This is really long, this is like three years ago. The idea, first of all, um, meant to be an approximation, which is faster to compute than actually trying to take each point, project it onto the sphere, and then compute the actual spherical distance. Right? And even that, of course, could have its problems. So, I mean, if you a point very close to, to, uh, to zero, I wouldn't want to consider that point. Um, so, the reason that this worked, gosh, Paul, do you remember this? Are you there? Guess he took. That's the idea. I guess I missed that. That this is meant to be an approximation to the distance uh, we get if you projected those two points onto the screen. Yeah. I was, I'm trying to rethink actually how the how the proof goes that this gives a good approximation to what you would expect, but of course it's in any real ground truth anyway. So with this, this is a, a yeah, I'm draw, I chose two points x and y over on this side. If I take x on one side and y way on the other, which is an r away, we define its distance to be infinite. Okay, that's the first thing. So we're only considering balls, and we actually only take points within the ball of radius two r and compute pairwise distance. This particular choice of, of uh, how to define the distance um, is fast to compute, and it sort of corresponds to pushing pushing away from the origin out and projecting the points on sphere is uh, is much easier than computing an actual vertical distance. And I think there's one more step to it than that that I'm not remembering. But anyway, about this thing is you can compute this. Knowing the actual coordinates, you can compute it from the pairwise distances. I think I said that, and that's what we do, which makes it very useful. Because often, if you're often we're trying to apply this to a very very high dimensional data set, and you don't want to actually compute there, but maybe you can compare them. I mean, let me give an example. We looked at uh, looked at some documents which were which were political blogs, and we did what's called bag of words. Counted how many uh, words of each type there were. With some modifications, two words were considered the same if they were had the same first two syllables or 
or something like that. Um, and you know, things like these and A's away. So for each pair of documents, we we get these counts of the numbers of words. And there's like you know, hundred thousand words might be considering in this particular uh, example. But it turns out that if you look at the, the if you look at the distance, uh, just the Euclidean distance, and only look at the the that they have in common, it, they're that many. So the actual distance matrix between the documents is much much easier to compute than their actual coordinates. So then apply this local spherical distance, and we were at trying now to to if we can understand if we automatically discover the topics that different individuals were talking about. And so we've done some progress on that. It's kind of working. It's interesting. Sorry, sorry to verify you with my face. Uh, so my, my question is, uh, how do you tell uh, a bad driver from a poorly sampled good driver, given that you're relying on points near the diagonal? Mostly because if you, I don't trust points near the diagonal, and now you're telling me they're important. Well, so what are points near, points near the diagonal? Are, um, you know, sample. Yeah, that's right. That could that certainly is, is an issue. But in a particular environment where we're working, we didn't really have that problem. That's you're absolutely right. That'd be uh, an extra level of complexity. But the point of points near the diagonal is that, uh, you know, like you see also, let me show you the the, the muscles. You know, the, the actual twist behavior there that you see is small scale behavior. That's that all shows up near the diagonal. And some with the driving, if, I don't have one, but if you draw, imagine a driver that, that speeds up to a certain certain speed very fast and drive in a very erratic way. It shifts lanes, speeds up, slows down, back and forth. My daughter claims I do this all the time, uh, et cetera. And uh, you'll see a lot of oscillations up around, you know, so you're driving out on the freeway, you'll see a lot of oscillations, the 65 and 75, but no real big oscillations in the grand scheme. So those points near the diagonal, even, even in the case of, of maze, are going to be uh, an indicator of someone who drives in a certain way. When you get into the real fine stuff about, you know, how, how the difference between somebody, two people who both drive around 65, one switches lanes and one another, that gets that gets to a whole different level, absolutely. But this is more of a proof of principle. So that's the, does that answer? Yeah, I think the. I mean, you know, looking at the brain maybe also should give you, give you. Well, I mean, I don't know. If, I actually should ask Paul. I don't know if this is a health, an older brain or a younger brain, but the younger brains, like yours, it tend to have nice smooth vessels, and ones like mine tend to have these spirals that sort of go in, like some. So I'm gonna pick those up. Uh, not, not, actually, you pick those up. I think more with a zero-dimensional persistence with, with small relations diagonal. But the birth time can be fairly high because because you're sweeping from the bottom, right? So they go, they get spread all along the diagram. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? All right, let's all thank John for a great talk. John. Okay, take care.